The Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. Practical Psychology for Today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, voiced by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from Oriental Magic by Idris Shah. This audio has been made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. Chapter 6. Juju Land of the Twin Niles Mungo comes into him, and he is made. In the Sudan, that sprawling territory between Egypt and Ethiopia, one-third the size of Europe, magic, black and white, still thrives. It took me over a year to disentangle and assess the three main kinds of sorcery and witchcraft in this strange yet fascinating area. To the north, where the Haifa cataract spills Nile water into Lower Egypt, temples and monuments tell a story of ancient pharaonic ways still reflected in the habits of the local tribes. To the west, among the towering Nuba Mountains, Rainmaking and the black art, gum picking and juju go hand in hand. To the far south, in the literally steaming equatorial belt beyond the administrative centre of Juba, naked, nilotic people still adorn themselves with the sacred creeper, wreak revenge through magic, and have constant recourse to local oracles. The main obstacle to piecing together confusing rituals was more than local reticence. This was not the first time a stranger had visited Nubia, seeking the law of the magicians, nor would it be the last. In the more frequented places, therefore, there was a continual stream of warriors or their ladies, bringing reputed spells or offering to conduct me to some sacred tree. Some of them claimed that the processes of liberating power hidden away in a miracle-working plant could be mine for a small present. For spears, money, or razor blades, a thousand spurious spells could be purchased daily from well-meaning, misguided, or downright dishonest locals. This was something to avoid, for in Khartoum and Omdurman, twin capitals of the Nile's junction, Travellers regularly bought secrets from the natives. A flourishing market in spells exists and thrives. So rampant indeed was this practice that I had to take an interpreter with me to some areas to explain my intention. I told the Nuba chiefs that I was a different kind of traveller. My work, I said, was writing books, so that those who came after would read the history and customs of their people, And here, perhaps surprisingly, I found a ready audience. The reason was probably due less to my persuasive powers than to the fact that the elders of many Sudan tribes nowadays do feel the draw to the cities deeply affecting their young men. When they return, tribal youths only too often seem to have lost interest in local ways, to have grown apart from their own kin. Their newfound sophistication often makes them despise even those noble traits that Westerners themselves and others see in African society. After I had mastered the technique of explaining these points, I found Nubas and Shiluks, Nyam Nyams and Hadendoas, whether from Arabized or Equatorial territory, generally anxious to explain their ways. In the Southern Belt, There is no doubt that magic is something in the nature of an organised belief, having their own temples, rites, secret societies, orders and degrees, the medicine men seem to possess a spell for every occasion and for any human emotion. Among the Nyam Nyams, whose territory is cut by French and Belgian administered areas, some of the practitioners hold their rank hereditarily. Yet in many cases young candidates present themselves for admission into a magic circle, after which they are entitled to consider themselves as fully-fledged sorcerers and to practice on their own account. Fine, upright, hardy men, 
the Negroid inhabitants of the far south present something of an enigma, at least so far as their mental makeup is concerned. You will find them very adaptable to modern things. They drive motor cars, learn English, adopt Christianity. Yet in the tribal areas, even the most modernized native will show such a mixture of Western and African ways that one sometimes cannot be sure of where his feelings lie. One thing, however, was plain. Most of the people still believe in their own form of magic. When the aspiring student presents himself to a witch doctor for training, he is always questioned closely as to his motives. If the answers satisfy the master, or the magic council, as the case may be, he will be accepted upon payment of a regular fee. This payment is considered to be most important, not only because of the money involved, which is usually small, equal to a penny or so, but because of the first principle of Nagua, or wonder-working. The reason given is that the presiding genie of Nagua, from whom all power is derived, demands a sacrifice of money, razor blades or other small gift. This is oddly reminiscent of the more western tradition of medieval magical ritual, in which regular sacrifices, or their equivalent, were made by the invocant. Similarly, when the witch doctor, the Ira, casts a spell for a client or exercises his powers in any way, he demands a coin, much in the same way as a gypsy asks for her palm to be crossed with silver before her power will work. I found few witch doctors reluctant to teach their law to an outsider, once they were convinced that I myself did not intend to use magic in their land. Several stipulated that I should not practice the art within a hundred days' journey, to which I readily agreed. So seriously was the matter treated, even when I had been taught spells, that it seems difficult to believe that the practitioners themselves can disbelieve in magic. The initiation starts with the master taking his pupil to a stream, and making him bathe therein. In the countries of the Arabized and Semitic Middle East, magic is considered to be destroyed by water, especially running water. Together they enter a cave or retire under an overhanging bank to assist the magic spirit to enter their hearts. This points to some traditional association with a water deity, now probably forgotten. When I asked the reason for it, they did not know, but all insisted that it was essential. Next, a flower resembling the common English primrose is picked and presented to the neophyte. After teaching him a number of simple spells, the tutor takes his student to a magician's conference, there to watch the rituals of the art. Typical of the spells is this one, for victory. I am a magician, all-powerful in spells. What I say comes true. I say, give victory to so-and-so, you will have victory in all things. Then the magician goes on to detail the kind of success desired, with many an embellishment of the prowess soon to be infused into the lucky warrior or huntsman. This was repeated seven times, the magician squatting on the bare earth. Before him stood the inevitable water-filled pot, in his hand the sacred whistle. When you say this, said the Ira in explanation of the spell, have a wooden whistle in your mouth, then blow it three times towards the points of the compass. All spells are regarded as more potent when said over running water. The sound of my homemade shower bath at once gave rise to the conviction that I was practicing my magic. One of my informants, seized with the desire to make another man fear him, took me on a plant-collecting expedition. Four different kinds of leaf were found. To these he added a handful of ground nuts. This was boiled, with fat and two small barkless twigs, in a pot over a wood fire. As soon as the concoction boiled, he muttered constantly under his breath, These are herbs. They have power. The nuts shall frighten my enemy. By the power of Nagua, the sticks are strong, they will beat the nuts, 
The water boils, boils like my rage, my rage upon the nuts, upon my enemy. He informed me two days later that his enemy had come to apologise and to ask for the spell to be removed. And how did you remove it? I asked. By smearing the herbs which I had buried upon the footpath, of course, was the reply. Otherwise he would rapidly have become worse than frightened, for my rage was great. Now he has even agreed to hunt for me and to help me with the land. Among this magic-ridden people, love charms are in great demand. One magician, offering to show me how to make one, asked whether they were in great demand in my country. The best I could reply was that they had been at one time. If I went there, could I help the people with them? came the query. I shuddered at the thought of this practitioner, however charming on his home ground, with gazelle horn cup, creeper skirt and string of bones, in a western metropolis. He was making it in any case, and invited me to watch, with all the courtesy of one professional entertaining another. This was going to be an elaborate procedure. First the circle was drawn in a clearing, then the usual pot suspended from three sticks was boiled. Powdered peanuts, charcoal and sand were thrown in. Meanwhile the witch doctor circumambulated the stew, carefully keeping within the protective circle, never taking his eyes off the mixture. After circling the pot about ten times, he threw twelve chicken feathers upon the bubbling surface, one at a time. About half a pint of oil completed the recipe. Taking up a small skin-covered drum, he beat it softly, alternately with the right and left hand. Then came the spell itself. I am a magician, O pot. You contain the medicines of love, the spell of love, of passion. My heart throbs like the drum, my blood boils like the water. This he repeated thrice. Then, gazing fixedly at the concoction, he intoned, Bring my desire to me, my name is so-and-so, and my desire is one whom I love. He assured me with the utmost solemnity that this spell, if repeated thrice on successive nights, would bind the beloved to him. And this was not all. If the water is boiled until there is none left, and you carry two pinches of the residue wrapped in a leaf, it will attract the opposite sex every time you bring it out and lay it before you. I asked him if this would not cause too widespread an effect. No, he replied, for they are not attracted until the spell is made complete by your looking at them, clenching both fists and putting them together, looking away and closing your eyes four times slowly. Each time you do it, he continued, it becomes more effective. But these spells are seldom practiced by the layman. For one thing, they are not told the full spell. Secondly, a fairly long training is necessary before they will work. Aspirants to the respected rank of magician persevere in the observance of taboos and diet for at least 40 to 60 days before casting a spell. No magic worker during the period of his study may look upon a member of the opposite sex for more than a few seconds, except after about seven in the evening. He eats certain things believed to bestow magical powers, especially green leaf vegetables, peanut paste and, sometimes, small birds. He wears a straw hat at night and sometimes two silver ornaments, such as pierced coins, Egyptian half-piastre pieces. With these badges on the right side of the head or body, he enters a building or crosses paths with one long and one short step. During all this time, he devotes half an hour after sundown to softly beating a small drum. Just before sunset, he spends at least five minutes gazing at the sky. In company, he closes his eyes and bites his lower lip frequently. He is expected to talk little, except to those whom he sees acting in the same way. Women do not practice magic as much as men. This, according to tribal belief, is not because they are any the less adept, but men are reluctant to teach them, 
there is a deeply ingrained fear of increasing power among women threatening to oust man from his paramount position. The three chords, two red and one white, often worn by male witch doctors, cannot safely be worn by women for fear of being detected as witches. Formerly, I was told, many women sported this insignia, which is believed to be a most powerful charm. The increase in power of their menfolk and the measures taken by European governments against sorcery have driven many of these customs out of currency. Curiously enough, though reputed to possess by virtue of their secrets the ability to destroy life, the present activities of the Central African juju men, so far as I could ascertain, seem mainly devoted to white magic. Most magicians hold that all death is due to magic being exercised against the deceased from somewhere or other, yet few of them are ever notorious as death dealers. One of the greatest known methods of gaining magical power, say the southerners, is the fish taboo. The intending magician asks for a fish to be placed before him by his wife a relative or someone else in that order of preference. He then blinks his eyes three times slowly, as though there is dust in them, frowns and orders the fish to be taken away, or he may merely touch it and leave the whole thing untasted. The reason given is that the spirits preventing me from becoming a magician are attracted by fish, hide in it to get inside of me when I eat it, and are taken away when I refuse it. The origins of these customs undoubtedly could be traced further back into history, though this would mean a great deal of research into tribal history and customs far beyond the scope of any one man, and through many territories of Central Africa. Anyone can become a magician, they believe, but certain individuals are held to be better fitted for the task. The ideal sorcerer was described to me as of average height, fair rather than dark, possibly because some of their magic comes from the fairer-skinned Coptic Abyssinians, and between 30 and 50, or 22 to 26 years of age. People with red and full lips are also preferred. I am convinced that there is often an element of auto-hypnosis in these magical arts. Sitting with his eyes unwinkingly fixed upon the surface of a pot of water, the operator's gaze nearly always seems to become vacant, as though in a trance. Then, while muttering spells repeatedly to the throb of the drum, and walking around and swinging his body from side to side, there is an atmosphere of vacancy and yet persistence, very compatible with the hypnoidal state. Much of Ethiopian occult lore has seeped through to the riverine southerners, one old man described to me the appearance and qualifications for a born magician, which approximates closely with certain legends of that country. The occultist, he said, may or may not know that he has the power. In either case he is to be sought and watched, for he is successful in life, and with very little effort can become a great magician. You will always meet him as a stranger, runs the legend, he is never a member of your own tribe, nor of your family. For in this case his magic would be of no use to you. He, or she, is of the opposite sex, tall, thin, young-seeming, the eyebrows being strongly marked, and with a fixed gaze. When one sees this man, he must be approached or spoken to on some pretext, and great advantage will come of it. There seems here to be some blending of that strange, legendary figure of the Middle East and Central Asia, Hida, Ilias, or Enoch, as he is sometimes called. The typical magician seldom wears much more than a loincloth when carrying out his duties. Considered necessary, however, for daily use is a brimmed straw hat with arrows drawn on the front. He walks over a grave in order to gain magical power, carries pierced horns to make the magic circle, and perseveres in his dieting and concentration until, one day, Mungo comes into him and he is made.
This is the training and effort that it takes to make a good medicine man in Africa. Now, Mungo is a sort of ectoplasm, believed to appear somewhere inside the witch as soon as the magic has matured inside him. Its possession is known to nobody except himself. It seems that this knowledge is thought to come intuitively, accompanied by a feeling of no more fear, a lightness. To sum up, one day after his diet and his drumming, his sky-gazing and blinking, having observed all the rites, the aspirant becomes aware that he is ready for action. These basic ideas permeate Nilotic witchcraft among the Nyamnyams, Shuluks, and others of Central Africa. By contrast, the magical operations of the Nubas of Kordofan in the Sudan's far west and the people whose homes border upon Egypt adhere more closely to the ancient Egyptian forms in their occult arts. In Kordofan, both men and girls perform ritual dances whose purpose may be described as magical. Like the southerners, white powder or bone ash is sometimes used to smear over the body. In Taloda, shaven heads and horsetail switches play an important part in ritual dancing, which is here performed communally by groups of tribesmen. While hidden beliefs dating from dynastic times still lurk, particularly among the Copts, in modern Egypt itself, it is in the border areas of the northern Sudan that the lingering superstitions and practices of 4,000 years ago may be found. No man or woman can be seen without the traditional charm, a hijab, for strength or against the evil eye. Mummy dust is greatly prized. The crumbling temples, such as that of Semna near the rushing Nile, are supposed to have been the seat of miraculous cures. Spells used by the nomad tribes seem to be phrased in a tongue which may be that of the pharaohs. There is no doubt that they themselves attribute the reputed efficacy of their magic to pharaonic origins. In the area of the former gold mines, once worked by ancient Egyptians, Romans, Greeks and Arabs, many a tale is told of those among the Hadendoa, fuzzy wuzzies, who are reputed to have learned the dark arts through a prolonged sojourn among the myriads of bats nesting in abandoned mine workings. These are said to have been the original mines of King Solomon, worked by the jinn, or genies, whose magical powers still linger there. I examined some of these workings and recalled the words of the Quran. And to Solomon we taught the use of blowing winds, and we subjected to him some of the evil ones, who dived for him and did other things besides. Much remains to be studied before an effective assessment of African magic can be made. Until then, notes such as these are all that can be offered. Does Central African magic work any wonders? Or does it perform any useful social function? I can give no better reply than that of a French officer of 30 years' equatorial experience. What can I say, monsieur? When one has lived with a thing, seen it every day for a lifetime, its demands provoke acceptance of much we cannot bring ourselves to believe in the West. Vast controversies have raged over the supposed possession of special and psychic powers by the Africans. To study them in more detail would involve collecting and sifting large quantities of material which are not strictly relevant to the main purpose of this book. In the chapter on ancient Egyptian magic, we have noted that there are indications that the southern countries of the Nile have played a part in the transmission of magical arts westwards. From this point, it is but a step to link up with hundreds of occult rites which are in use or were formerly practiced by other native African peoples. The most that we can do, however, in the present book is to note outstanding characteristics among the magic of African populations even farther southwards than the Sudanese. The peoples loosely known as Kafirs, from the Arabic Kafir, infidel, possess a rich store of knowledge and belief in things occult. Like other magical systems, they possess rites for divination, diagnosis and cure of disease, 
and communication with spirits. Add to this their belief in amulets and talismans, plus the practice of thaumaturgy, and you have a picture of the supposed powers of shamans, medicine men, witch doctors, call them what you will, everywhere. A man's picture, effigy, or even shadow can be worked upon by magic, say the Kafirs, in common with the Japanese, British witches, Chaldeans, or Egyptians. Illness, as in the case of primitive, and even later, Semitic ideas, can be transferred to animals. Scapegoats, too, are offered as sacrifices. Wizards, like Tata and others, can revive the dead, even from their graves. Wealth can come to a man through magic, but the snag here is that a man suspected of getting rich quick through supernatural means may find himself on trial, like the witches of Spain or England in former times. His trial, like theirs, will involve ordeal by fire or water, even, as with the ancient Greeks, by poison. As the medieval witches were supposed to covet human babies for their dark art, so do Kafir sorcerers the same. All these resemblances, and many more, are there for the culling. While it would be difficult to establish whether these and other practices originated in Africa, or spread there from other continents, nevertheless I think that the interesting facts are these. 1. That here we may have rites which still linger, though they have died out elsewhere. 2. They seem too widespread and similar to other countries' magic to have been developed independently, and to have grown up in a manner parallel to their appearance in other lands. Witch doctors wear special regalia. They make brews closely resembling those of Oriental and Western magic. They divine by bones, the Amazulu crystal gaze. Exorcism and other demon-expelling processes are common. Is it likely that all these facts are mere coincidence? If they are, it is remarkable enough. If they are not, they are more than deserving of closer attention. And this attention would be rewarding, no matter whether you approach the subject from the viewpoint of occultist, sceptic, scientist or mystic. But that would have to be the subject of a further book. This podcast is copyright 2018, the Idris Shah Foundation.